Hello and welcome to another in the series of the Institute of Health Studies Research Seminars. Before Christmas we enjoyed an interesting presentation from Bob Gann on the topic of NHS Direct Online. This month I'm delighted to introduce Professor Mike Highland. Mike is from the Department of Psychology, University of Plymouth and will discuss with us new ways of thinking about complementary medicine. Joining Mike and I today are Jacqueline Sullivan, who is a community nurse from Mid Devon, Graham Russell, and Alistair McConnell, who are senior lecturers with the Institute of Health Studies. They will assist us in further inquiry of Mike's presentation while we await your telephone calls. The number to call is 01752 233 646, or you can email us on tvstudios at plymouth.ac.uk. Today's programme will follow its usual format. I will shortly hand over to Mike, and following his presentation, we will be keen to receive your calls. This is, will be about between 12.30 and 1 o'clock. Can I remind you at this point that you do need to utilise a mute button on your handset as you speak? This will avoid the feedback sometimes experienced. Do call. Your contributions are most valuable. Now, without further delay, I'll hand over to Mike to enjoy new ways of thinking about complementary medicine. Welcome, wherever you're listening. And perhaps I could say before I start that from my perspective, there's no such thing as a silly question or a silly comment. So, Whatever it is, uh, email us, phone us. We'd be deli delighted to hear from you. Now, before talking about complementary medicine, I think it's useful to put it in the context of conventional medicine. And I think it's equally important to recognise how successful conventional medicine has been. If we evaluate the various parts of conventional medicine in terms of lives saved, undoubtedly immunisation is the great lifesaver. That has saved millions and millions of lives. But there have been other very important developments. Antibiotics have saved lives, equally the development of steroids. We can now control inflammatory diseases which otherwise would have killed people. Modern medicine has also been very successful in the management of trauma and in surgery. However you look at it, modern medicine has been a very successful endeavour. But there are certain areas where modern medicine has been less successful. One of these areas is what is generally known as malaise states, or sometimes called polysymptomatic malaise. And although they're not familiar to hospital doctors, they'll be familiar to every GP. These are patients who feel a little unwell. They often have mouth ulcers, or repeated headaches, or repeated episodes of colds. They have gastric complaints, diarrhea, and constipation. They're frequently depressed, and often they're very tired. And they come into the GP and they say, Doctor, I'm not feeling very well. What's wrong with me? And the doctor can say nothing. Because there is no disease for these patients. There's no treatment. At the extreme end of these malaise states, there are diseases which have got labels, such as, such as irritable bowel syndrome. Now, in irritable bowel syndrome, you have a particular abnormal function of the bowel, but there's no pathophysiology. There's nothing which you can actually see wrong in the bowel itself. We don't really know what causes it. And if we take that very puzzling disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, or ME stroke CFS, as it's called these days, well, there are abnormalities. You have low cortisol levels. You have slightly raised cytokines. But nothing so abnormal that you can really explain the tremendous disability with these patients. So here again, we have a puzzle which is not explained. No real clear treatment for either of these diseases in terms of medicines. And finally, chronic diseases. Well, medicine... Uh, modern medicine has been very good in controlling many chronic diseases. Let's take asthma. Asthma is caused by inflammation in the lungs, in the airways. And uh, we have some very effective drugs, in fact steroids, which will reduce that inflammation. It keeps people alive, it keeps them perfectly healthy. But it doesn't cure the asthma. It's rather like having a fire which you're constantly having to pour water over. We never actually put the fire out. So whereas modern medicine is good at managing many chronic diseases, in other cases, particularly these autoimmune or inflammatory diseases, asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, um, multiple sclerosis, 
prostatitis, all these various things, they are particularly difficult for modern medicine to actually cure. Now, modern medicine is based on a set of ideas or assumptions. It's based and it derives from an analogy, an analogy with mechanism. You can often say that modern medicine derives its intellectual roots from the development of clocks in the Middle Ages. Clocks which led to steam engines and eventually to computers. And the central idea is that one can treat the body as a machine. Harvey's discovery of the circulation of the blood was a prime example of a discovery which showed that the body is just a pumping system. And of course, if we have a machine, machines have specific faults. When your car breaks down, there's always a particular fault that is actually responsible for it, whether it's in the ignition, whether it's in the petrol system, whatever, there's always a specific fault. So the idea of a specific fault is an assumption which modern medicine has. And if we look at that particular assumption, we find that the diseases that modern medicine is most successful at treating are those diseases where there's a specific function, a specific error. If we correct that specific error, then modern medicine is generally successful. When we turn to complementary and alternative medicines, and there's a whole range of them, they're also sometimes referred to as traditional medicines because some of them uh, go back many years. Modern medicine actually derives from one of those traditional medicines, Hippocratic medicine. Here we have a very different idea that the body is a system in balance. The Hippocratic medicine, it was the balance of the four humours. Black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, I always like the phlegm, and blood. If you look at Chinese medicine, well, there are a whole lot of other yins and yangs and other things. And in uh, Ayurvedic medicine, you have the doshas. And the essential idea is that disease is caused by an imbalance in the, these, uh, these humours, or whatever it is, which permeates the whole body. And treatment consists of correcting this imbalance, an entirely different view. There isn't a localised cause of disease, it's a distributed cause of disease. Now, why did medicine, why, why did medicine, medicine reject the assumptions of distributed disease? Because that's precisely what it did. When modern medicine grew out of Hippocratic medicine, what it actually did was develop a new idea based on localised disease. And the reason was very simple, that there's no, or there was no, at the time, clear scientific evidence for anything other than mechanism. We think that it was not only clocks and steam engines, the whole idea of the universe was based on the idea of mechanism. God was a kind of mechanical uh, puppeteer, and we were the puppets who were mechanically manipulated. And so this idea that the uh, body was a machine wasn't just an uh, idiosyncratic idea which was found in medicine, it was an idea which was found throughout the whole of the science in the 18th and 19th centuries, and also in the 20th century. But there has always been a problem in applying the mechanical analogy to humans, or indeed to organisms. And it's a problem which has been recognised for many years. In fact, there was a large discussion about it in the 1920s and 30s. And the problem is that there always seems to be some very important difference between living creatures and mechanical systems. Let's take the example of a jumbo jet. A jumbo jet is in many ways like a body. It has specific parts. Just like you have your toes and your hands, the jumbo jet has its wings and its engines. But the jumbo jet also has systems. It has in its electrical system, it has a hydraulic system, just like you have systems. You have an immune system and you have an endocrine system. So there's a lot of similarity between the jumbo jet and a human, but there's one important difference, and that is that big jumbo jets don't grow from little jumbo jets. And if a big jumbo jet goes wrong, then the big jumbo jet doesn't heal itself. It has to be taken into a hangar and a completely different system. These intelligent humans have to swarm over it, getting it right. So that is a, a real problem with the mechanical analogy. And there have been two approaches, two ways of solving this, none of which, until recently, have been very satisfactory. One was the idea of vitalism. Now, you know the, the story of Frankenstein. Frankenstein gets a, a dead body, and he, or parts of a dead body, sews them together, and, but of course it isn't alive. It hasn't got something which makes it alive. And uh, Mary Shelley used this idea of vitalism, and very simply, 
So you've got a mysterious force. Now, in the 19th century, the mysterious force was, was electricity. There are lots of other mysterious forces, such as uh, nuclear energy, which you'd have today, but then it was electricity. The dead body is connected up to this mysterious force and zaps it, and lo and behold, we get a living body. That was the idea of vitalism. But there was also another suggestion, which was never proved in the early 20s and 30s, which was that the bodies of living organisms are organised in some fundamentally different way. And it's the process of, it's the phenomenon of organisation which differentiates living creatures from mechanical systems. Well, no one could guess what that different organisation was. And it took really till the end of the 20th century for the development of complexity theory and a beginning of an understanding of what that was. Now, I want you to give, a, to give you a very simple understanding of complexity theory by an analogy. And this is the analogy of a flock of birds versus a clock. Now, just imagine a clock, the old mechanical analogy, the mechanical system. If you remove a cog from a clock, however small, the clock will stop. That's what happens in mechanical systems. They're very sensitive to local error. And that's what happens in your car when it breaks down, and that's what happens in a jumbo jet when it breaks down. But now let's turn to a flock of birds. And don't you sometimes think that flocks of birds are magical things? Well, the reason you think they're magical is because you don't really understand how they work. You're looking for a leader in a flock of birds, but flocks of birds have no leaders. If a flock of birds is, is flying along and you shoot a bird out of that flock, the bird will fall to the ground. But the flock will go on. It will be completely insensitive to the missing member who's been removed from it. And that, I think, illustrates a very interesting feature. Flocks of birds work because they are very, very simple network systems. And it seems as though life has exploited a particular characteristic, the network system, and it's these network systems which have some very special properties. One of these special properties of network systems is that they can have something called self-organization. If we look at it in terms of the brain, we call it learning. But what it means is the system can change itself, it can modify itself, it becomes better, it can adapt to new circumstances. It's good at pattern recognition. This tolerance of local error is something I referred to earlier. And a very important idea which we find in the brain, the idea of distributed information. Information is distributed over the whole system. Now, let's go back to the conventional perspective of medicine, the mechanical analogy. And one of the important theoretical ideas in conventional medicine is the idea of a control system. The idea is that temperature is regulated by means of a control system. When you get too hot, you start to sweat. When you get too cold, you start to shiver. And of course, that's physiological adaptation, but there are also behavioral adaptations. If you get too hot, you can take your clothes off, and if you t get too cold, you put some more clothes on. So we have behavioral control, and we have physiological control. And um, one of the assumptions of modern medicine is that these various control systems are essentially independent, or if we, one might add, just haphazardly connected. So if we take the temperature regulation system, that's independent of the glucose regulation system, and it's independent of your steroid uh, uh, control system. The problem is that if you look at how these control systems function, they seem to be joint in some way. There seems to be some connection. For example, you shiver and you put on clothes. The two seem to be connected. And you can give many examples where you can illustrate the fact that uh, the high level, that there is some sort of high level organization which in some sense um, coordinates the various control systems. Take the fight and flight mechanism. This is where you get an external threat which needs some behavioral adaptation. But at the same time, there's a whole range of internal physiological changes that take place. The whole thing is miraculously coordinated. And this leads to the idea that if we have a series of control systems, there is also some higher level control system. There's something which is organizing it in some way. And the problem is then, what is this high level? If there is a high level control system, and the behavior of the body seems to suggest there is, what is it? And because networks seem to be a very interesting feature, an interesting type of, com of complex system, um, and also networks have some assumptions, have some features which are consistent with the assumptions of complementary and alternative medicine, that has been where the attention has focused. And the particular idea which has been developed, and it's an idea which I've 
been particularly supportive of is the idea of the extended network. Now, it's a very simple logical sequence. We know that the brain is a network. The brain looks like a network. The brain operates like a complex system. That's what artificial intelligence is all about. It's a parallel processing system which can do things which mechanical systems, which are not parallel processing, cannot do. For example, pattern recognition. If you have a pattern recognizing feature in your computer, what it's actually doing is simulating one of these network systems. So we know the bod the pub that the brain is one of these rather interesting network systems. We also know that the physiological and behavioural regulation systems are coordinated. I gave the example just now of the fight and flight response, but I could also have cited the response that the behavioural response to immune challenge. When you have an infection, when you have any sort of trauma, this produces cytokines. There are receptors in the hypothalamus for cytokines, and the effect of stimulation of those receptors is to make you feel sleepy and tired. So when you get an infection, you go to bed because of the cytokines. Your flu symptoms are due to the cytokines, not due to the flu virus. The whole brain-body system is a regulating system. It's a self-regulating system which is coordinated. The extended network extends throughout the whole body, and it's not just neurological, it also consists of humoral links between uh, ligands and receptors. Now, if it's a, if the whole body is an intelligent system, because that's what I'm suggesting, not just the brain is an intelligent system, then of course it's possible that there are errors. And if there are errors in this higher level control system, it's that error which then is responsible for the errors in the lower level systems. Because what the higher level system does is it sets the parameters of the lower level control systems. Just as you can imagine if you have a thermostat in your room, which is the lower level control system, you can actually alter that thermostat. That's you acting as a higher level control system. So when we have a disease such as asthma, which has an overactive immune response in the lungs, it's, if you like, a control system which has been jacked up too high, it's as though someone has turned the thermostat up. That's the responsibility of the higher level control system, of the higher level uh, organizing system. So what is extended network error? The error at this higher level system, I'm going to read it out, it's self-organizational change, so it's a change in the sort of learning pattern of the network, brought about by learning rules, because these networks have learning rules, that normally contribute to more effective self-regulation, but which under specific circumstances cause dysregulation. So disease or dysregulation at the higher level, the extended network, is caused by rules which normally are self-effective, which are effective. And that, I think, is very important, that we must think about this dysregulation, not as something which comes in from the outside, not as some sort of foreign agent which makes you ill, but rather as a normally adaptive rule which is going wrong. And the rule which I think is most important is the compensation rule. And uh, so I've got a little diagram here. Let's suppose that the network expects whenever A is, produces a response, that B produces a response. Okay? So it's expecting A to lead to B. A causes B. But now let's suppose that we interrupt this sequence, A to B, by an inhibiting factor effect from something else called C. So the transference of information through the network from A to B is inhibited. What the network will do will be to self-organize to reassert its A-B connection. It will potentiate the response of B to A, or it will increase the output from A to B. In other words, if you are in a room and you're too cold, and you're consistently too cold, what you do, you turn up the thermostat. Then, of course, if the reason the room is too cold because the window is open, turning up the thermostat is not necessarily the sensible thing to do. And this, really, this fact that sometimes the compensation rule goes wrong uh, can be illustrated with several examples, one of which is the... Um, combination of immune challenge and immune suppressant. Let's take a disease such as asthma. We know that the causes of asthma fall into two categories. There are those that are immune challenges, such as viruses. We know that there are those that are immune suppressants, such as dirty air. So we have the viruses on the one hand, we have the house dust mite, all immune challenges. We have the dirty air, we have the pollutants on the other. Now, what happens if you combine, in the lung, an immune challenge with an immune suppress suppression? Well, you'll suppress the normal immune response to the virus or allergen or whatever. 
And what will happen then is that the system will compensate for this immune suppression by potentiating the immune response. In other words, the thermostat is jacked up. And that is a very simple example of what happens, uh, or what one imagines might happen, to explain the potentiation of a particular immune response. The physiological challenge plus lifestyle challenges is a particularly nice idea because this provides a, a very neat explanation for an observation of chronic fatigue syndrome that is often caused, but not invariably, by a combination of immune challenge and lifestyle challenge. Typically it will be the student or the child who's working for A-levels, um, ever so worried about the A-levels, develops some infection, whether it's a flu, whether it's some other infection, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't matter what infection seems to be uh, in, uh, there. Some are more, uh, more likely to create this disease than others. Glandular fever, the virus associated with glandular fever is one. But let's suppose we put those two together. Now what happens when you get a virus is normally you feel tired. But if you keep suppressing this tiredness, because you know you can suppress tiredness, if you just keep on working away, what will happen? Well, the system will readjust. It will readjust so that a low level of cytokines, the factors which make you tired, now make you feel tired. In other words, it will give up. It will say to itself, this person is not responding appropriately to my, to my cytokine messages because they're keeping on working. So what are we going to do? We're going to change the message. So you end up with this particular disease. So the compensation rule can explain how some of these very puzzling diseases, in um, puzzling to modern medicine, can develop. And this leads to a very important distinction between robust and subtle therapy. And the distinction is that most conventional medicines, but not all, are robust in the sense that they're dealing with the lower level control systems. They're actually getting things right. They're mending broken parts. But there's a higher level error in the system which can be controlled by what we call subtle therapy. And actually there are many subtle therapies in conventional medicine. Exercise therapy is part of modern medicine, and exercise therapy has a range of benefits for patients, and it seems to be one of the things it does is it improves the way the whole network functions. So, for example, um, subtle therapy will reduce irritable bowel, sorry, uh, exercise will reduce irritable bowel syndrome. It will also tend to reduce depression. Not necessarily always effectively, but as a whole, it will tend to have those effects. So we need both subtle therapy and robust therapy, and the interesting suggestion now comes that complementary medicine is working on subtle therapy, not on robust therapy. Or at least most complementary medicines, because I think if you take herbal me remedies, which I think are a very special category, those are probably acting as robust therapies. They're working in the same sort of way as conventional medicine. So if we think about subtle therapies, well, there, there are two ways in which we can alter a network. Uh, they're what I call push therapies, and they're what I call pull therapies. Let's take an example of homeopathy, and I want to leave the actual mechanism underlying homeopathy uh, to the one side for a moment. One of the things which homeopathy does is something which is actually predates the development of homeopathy, the idea that giving a, a, a particular chemical agent which creates a symptom will reduce that symptom. Like treat like with like, the similarium principle. And um, if you think about it, if you give the body the message that it's iller than it actually is, the body will tend to compensate for that message by springing back in the opposite direction. So giving a message that you're iller than you are, the self-regulatory extended network will respond to that by a change. Pull therapies are, have the opposite effect. They simply pull the network back in the therapeutic direction. So we probably have, within subtle therapies, and therefore within complementary medicines, those which are push therapies and those which are pull therapies. And one of the predictions, of course, of a push therapy is that you should initially have more symptoms before you get better. And what is very interesting is that if you look at all natural medicines, whether it's homeopathy, whether it's healing, whatever, there's often a report of what's sometimes described as aggravation or cleansing or whatever. There's a report of something which appears as though you're getting an increased symptomatology. And that would be consistent with this idea that you have a, a deterioration. In fact, a, a very recent study published last year in the BMJ on homeopathy uh, identified an oscillation. You get worse, you get better, you get worse, you get better. And again, that is consistent with that particular theoretical prediction. The 
question, and I think is, this is one of the most important questions, is how is the network actually influenced by these, um, by these complementary and alternative medicine treatments? And of course there are a whole range of treatments. They fall into to various categories. Um, the recent House of Lords report on complementary medicine put them into three categories of, of validity, but uh, you can also look at them in terms of those which involve chemical agents of some kind, or purported chemical agents, um, those which involve some sort of physical manipulation, and those that involve some sort of healing. Um, one of the problems is that none of the mechanisms which the various therapies suggest really seem to be supported by the data. Um, and I, I think we can divide people into the believers, those who believe it works, and the non-believers, and those who don't believe it works. And um, they believe those positions very strongly. And unfortunately, the data simply doesn't support either of those positions. Uh, there, there's data supporting, in some cases, the efficacy of complementary medicine, but it's not sufficiently strong for you to say, well, the believers are right. And equally, this data which supports the non-efficacy of complementary medicine, but it's not sufficiently strong to confirm the view that the non-believers want to, to, to believe. And this leads us to a third way, um, and that brings us back to the mechanisms. And um, I've put here so three mechanisms, physical. So let's take massage as an example. With massage, we have the mechanism of physical manipulation. But when you're massaging a patient, you're also going to engage in some sort of psychological effect. In fact, massage is a very interesting psychological manipulation because when you're massaged, you feel incredibly safe. So it has very profound psychological effects. Well, those, in a sense, are non-controversial. What is more controversial is an idea called generalised entanglement. Now, entanglement is an idea or a, a theoretical prediction which comes from quantum mechanics, which quite simply shows that at a quantum level, when you have holistic symptoms, holistic systems, the elements of the system can become entangled, so that affecting one element at one part of the system would have an instant effect on the another element in that system. It's sometimes called non-local causality, because it appears as though you can alter an atom here and instantaneously, another effect will occur on the other side. Now, the idea of entanglement is reasonably well established in quantum mechanics. But of course, it's applied at a quantum level, at this very small level. A paper published last year in Foundations of Physics set out the mathematics to suggest that it would be possible, under certain circumstances, for entanglement to occur at some sort of macro level. And that's led to the idea of generalised entanglement. And it's this particular idea of generalised entanglement which many people think may underlie some of the therapeutic interventions. In other words, if we, go back, oops, if we go back to the data again, there is a third way. The believers have got it incorrect and the non-believers have got it incorrect. Um, the believers have got it incorrect because, the, for example, in homeopathy, it's not memory of water which is being tested. It's some other thing and it may be some form of entanglement. Now this is a very speculative idea and there's no clear evidence as yet for generalised entanglement. There are some research ideas at the moment in the planning stage for testing it. So let's um, end up with some conclusions. I think we have to consider the possibility that practitioners complementary and alternative medicine are effective for reasons other than those they believe in. It may well be that they are having psychological effects. We know that placebo effects are immensely strong, and they can also be very long-lasting. Placebo effects include expectancy, expectation that you're going to do better. It also includes the therapeutic relationship, and obviously when a complementary therapist interacts with patients, they do it in a very different way from the GP because they have much more time. GP has eight minutes, perhaps less. Complementary therapists will typically have half an hour or an hour. Um, so we're going to get psychologically mediated effects. But there may also be an effect which is caused by entanglement. And that is the interesting question. Are we getting some effects above and beyond the physical effects of manipulation in the massage? Above the, the psychological effects, are we getting some other effect? Now, there's no clear answer to that at the moment, but that, I think, is an interesting theoretical speculation which has a lot of bearing on the way we think about complementary medicine. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mike, for a very interesting, for a very interesting um, seminar. We're waiting for your calls, and if you could telephone 01752 233 646 or email us on at tvstudios at plymouth.ac.uk. We're very keen to receive your calls. Um, Mike, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I would like to start with a question, if I may. Um, my first question is, you've shown how you've arrived at en entanglement, but how do you propose to get some evidence to support your theory? We are at the moment designing some studies which are specifically on that on that particular idea, and I can't really give the details of those studies at, at the moment. But the, there are certain predictions which come from the, the physics of entanglement, which allow us, allows us actually to test it out. Oh. In, in a, there are two ways of doing it, really. One is sort of laboratory-based, and the other is looking at real-life interactions, and both of those are, are, are being, being explored. Thank you. Um, Jack, did you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, Mike, I'd just like to ask, if you can look at entanglement at a macro level, mm -hmm. do you think that this might explain the connections that many complementary therapists claim that exist between them and their patient? So that the entanglement is not just within the patient, but between two separate... Yes, uh, yes. ...which are separated objects. It's interesting. I've been doing a, a study <coughs> with, um, actually, a massage therapist from the Claire Maxwell Hudson School of Massage up in London, mm -hmm. and uh, they put out a questionnaire in, in their, their journal, um, which asked about the experience of connection. Yeah. And it asked various questions such as, is it an all or none phenomenon? And it asked about the conditions in which it occurs. Mm -hmm. And the responses are coming back. We haven't written it up yet. But what is interesting is that there is a pattern emerging. Right. For example, there's a perception that it is an all or none phenomenon, that you're either connected or you're not, which I guess is what you'd actually theoretically expect. Uh, and you're, we're getting other predictions as well, which seems to be that the, the state of the patient, the mental state of the patient is important. And that again will be consistent with this idea that it's a two-way entanglement. Yeah. It's not something that you're just doing. Yeah. You have to have some kind of relationship built An up. Interaction. So yes, that, that's... And what's interesting is that this idea of a sort of connection is not in the theory of mm -hmm. massage. It's not in the theory of homeopathy, but yeah. homeopaths will also experience it. So it's again, it's... If you go and ask the therapists what actually happens on the ground, you'll sometimes get this slightly different perspective of what they think they're actually doing. Yes. And I think that, that's, that's actually quite useful. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. Graham. Yes, Mike. Hi. I was interested, as, as I'm sure you're aware, Mike, one of the early kind of critiques or a, a critique of mind-body research mm. has, has been the failure of researchers to actually demonstrate robust um, sort of... Um, mind physiological pathways. Um, given, the, given the, the kind of proposed complexity of these systems, the notion of different levels of control mm. and imbalance mm. and error in the system, do you think that it is, it is um, it's sort of viable or realistic to pursue models that demonstrate um, pathways between the mind and the body, or do you think that might be an illusory goal? Well, the connection between the mind and the body, I mean, there, there are two issues about yeah. that particular pathway. Um, how the actual mind affects the body is a, th a rather interesting theoretical problem, but where it affects the, the brain and has so into the body, that isn't, isn't too, that's reasonably well understood, mm -hmm. so that you can actually understand um, how particular mental states will produce particular chemicals, and how those chemicals will then have other effects. So mind-body medicine is in a sense not terribly controversial, or it's less controversial than you might imagine. And certainly if you look at the research on a variety of, of techniques, such as meditation, very robust data on meditation and, and how it affects the physiology. Right? So we know, you know that it reduces the autonomic response, we know it reduces uh, other chemical responses. We know, for example, that um, therapeutic relationships you know, that if you have good social support, if you feel you know, loved, because I think that's a very important mm -hmm. uh, idea, um, that this has effects on the immune system, that it affects um, the um, endocrine system. We know all about that. So it, that is fairly well established. Where I think we do get a little bit of a problem is understanding the, how particular mental states affect the brain. And I think there are explanations which you have to go into complexity theory for, mm -hmm. because I think if you look on the brain as a simple mechanical system, then of course you run into problems. But if you think of the brain 
as, if you think of the mind as simply a property of a complex system, then it actually becomes more simple. And in fact, you run into the very interesting question, where is the mind? And it's not in the brain, it's in the whole body. Because you see, you can't say that the, if, the, if there's an extended network, it's absolutely meaningless to talk about the, the mind being in the brain. It has to be in the whole body. So you would suggest that happiness, for example, is something that resides within the whole body rather oh, than purely in oh, yes. some kind I mean, of... In fact, if, if, brain, yeah. if, you, if you think of it uh, from mm. the point of view of... Um, let's think of the gut. The gut is full of neuroreceptors. So, you know, you, to have an unhappy gut is, is quite, a, you know, mm. quite a meaningful thing. And, um, you know, if you think endorphins sweep around all over the place, and they have all kinds... I mean, it's not just pain relieving effects, they have all kinds of effects on the body. Mm. So, you know, I think being happy is throughout the whole body. Mm. And I think one of the interesting things is that it's... We've tended to think of it causing one or the other, without thinking that they actually go up together. So, you know, when you're depressed, your immune system is suppressed. And if you take an immune suppressant, if you, if you take a virus, you see, pick up a virus which tends to suppress your immune system, it's going to make you feel a bit depressed. Mm. You see, I mean, that's, that's the way the system works. So, in fact, you can, I think, very well get an insight into the network by looking at psychological states, because that will give you some sort of idea of how, how much that network is compromised. And in fact, we've looked at, um, in, I, I mentioned that, that asthma study which we published in the BNJ last year, uh, where we got the oscillation. We also got an oscillation in mood, which is very interesting. We got an oscillation in peak flow, which, you know, a purely physiological measure, and we also got an oscillation in mood, which would, again, consistent with this idea that it's the network which is oscillating. Yeah. I think the network oscillates very slowly, and I think that is part of the problem, that when you engage in a, a complementary therapy and you get instantaneous effects, that may well be placebo mediated. I think what the network is doing is doing much more slow things. Yeah, I mean that's a well recognised effect I think in, yeah. in psychology psychiatry, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. That it takes quite some time for mood to actually change yeah. fundamentally. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Alistair, yes, I just <coughs> excuse me, it's curious, you mentioned the connection between the therapist and mm. the client, whatever. Yeah. How do you perceive this connection to be? And do you just see it between the two people or between other people as well? I mean, what form do you see your yes. connection taking? I mean, if, if, it's, if it's a generalised yeah. entanglement, it'll obviously be a connection which depends on there being a macro system. Mm. Right? So in other words, the, the prediction is that if you set up a healing experiment with people behind screens mm. and healers who've never seen yeah. them, it's not going to work. Mm. And of course there have been studies which have done yeah. that and shown that healing doesn't work, but of course that's testing a mechanism. Yeah. I always say that tests, if you test efficacy, you're always assuming a mechanism. Mm. Right? And it's, in that case I think it's the wrong mechanism. Mm. So I think that what you're dealing with is a system. Now, obviously, you know, when you're acting as a, a, as a mm. therapist, you may be healing on a one-to-one one one basis, mm. so it's a diet. Yeah. But equally, there may be group contexts. Yeah. And I think, you know, if we look at how some primitive groups mm. uh, engage in healing, you know, you have the sick person and you all dance around and you, you engage in a particular healing ritual, mm. it may be that you've got this uh, a healing effect which is occurring yeah. uh, between groups. That's an interesting point which, interestingly, isn't there in the literature. Or indeed, yeah. I haven't considered it. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet, but <laughs> so that's actually very, yeah. that's very helpful. Mm. I mean, it may be that these um, multi-entangled systems yeah. are more powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, if you look at the sh shamanistic type of healing, yeah. which is essentially... I mean, shamanistic healing again usually mixes two things. It's got the entanglement, yeah. but it's also got the psychological things, mm -hmm. because you know, shamanistic jo journeying and all that is a pretty good meditation mm -hmm. exercise, and we do know that straightforward meditation is therapeutic. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I think the biggest problem for research is distinguishing two clear therapeutic processes, both of which are difficult to get a handle on. One is psychologically mediated. I don't like the word placebo because placebo tends to mean expectancy. I mean, if it, but it also can include, you know, the therapeutic relationship, the empowerment, all those other things. So if we just talk about psychologically mediated effects and the entanglement effects, you don't get them without the, you know, one occurs, they both occur at the same time, and that's the challenge for our empirical studies. Okay, Mike, I just need to interrupt. We've got a caller. Um, I think it's rare on the phone. Um, if, if you, Ray, if, are you ready for your question, please? Hello, hello. Um, this is uh, Ray Jones from Plymouth. Yes, thanks very much for a really interesting presentation, Mike. Um, I've got two, um, sort of one point one questions, and I'm going to put the phone down because I've got to go back. My my TV is in a different place than the phone. Um, so the, the the one point was about you were originally talking about these. Uh, your flocks of birds, and I immediately thought of the internet, of course, because if you take out one computer in the internet, it carries on mm. much as before. And I wonder if, you know, 
those, of course, are inanimate objects. Does that, is that a complex system? And whereabouts does a, a network uh, of that sort become complex and where is it simple? Let me give my second question and then I can go and put the phone down and listen to the answer. Um, yes. The second one was, does your theory therefore mean that the people um, who are giving the treatment in, the, sort of in this entanglement idea, do they have to believe in it? I mean, and, and is, that, is there a carryover from that into modern medicine? I mean, does it make a difference if a GP believes that the steroids he gives for asthma are, are work or not? So uh, can you give me two seconds to go and uh, get back to my screen to hear your answer? <laughs> Thanks. Well, I'll certainly give Ray his two, two seconds. I mean, those b both actually very relevant questions, mm -hmm. because I think the, the first question um, relates to what we understand by complex systems and networks. And if, you go, if you're a complex theorist, you realize that, the, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, that there are actually different types of networks, and different types of networks operate in different ways, and not all networks are self-organizing networks. And one of the features of the uh, self-organizing network is that the activation rules can change. Now, what do we mean by an activation rules? It means that it's the, the amount of connection between the various elements in the network. And really, um, the internet isn't that kind of, uh, hasn't got that degree of complexity in it. It hasn't got that sophistication. So the, 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 the internet is really a, it is a network system, but it hasn't got, you know, as a network, it hasn't quite got the, the sort of complex uh, processes which seem to be needed for some of these more, uh, the sort of things we're talking about. So, although it is a network, it's not the sort of network we mean when we talk about the body as, as an extended network. So that's the answer to the, to the first question. The answer to the second question, which is an interesting one, because um, the second question was, you know, do you, does the therapist have to believe in their, in their therapy? And I think that there are two things here. Um, one is that when therapists give a therapy, they obviously have a psychologically mediated effect in terms of expectancy. And if they say, well, this is really going to work, obviously the patient is going to pick that up. And if they say, well, it may work, it may not, it's, who knows, you know, it's, it's going to be less effective. And you know, I've used the word um, concerned optimism as being a good sort of uh, way of, uh, of communicating with the patient that you must be concerned about the patient because you're trying to do the best for them and you must be reasonably optimistic in what you're doing. That I don't think is entanglement. I think that's, that's a straightforward psychologically mediated effect. I think entanglement is actually an intention to heal. And I think that is irrespective of whether you believe the therapy is working. I think it's something which is to do in some way with a connection between person and person. I don't think it's unique to complementary and alternative medicine. I think you sometimes get it in that. I sometimes think you don't. But I think you also get it with, with practitioners um, who, are, who are medically qualified, who are engaging in conventional medicine. I think you also may get it with people who are simply friends or relations. So I think that the phenomenon of entanglement is far more widespread than, than simply complementary medicine. And also I think that uh, one of the implications that you didn't ask but it's implied by your question is that the, um, the nature of the, the therapist, the, if you like the mental state of the therapist is important. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was talking to this actually to a, to a colleague, um, Adrian White, who said, well, did you know that when holistic medicine started, one of the key ideas was that the therapist should look after themselves. Mm -hmm. In other words, you have to be a, a healthy person to be a therapist. And um, that's, that idea has kind of run through. Uh, interestingly enough, it's, it's, it's one of the ideas in the Peninsula Medical School that you, know, you ought to be reasonably healthy if you're going to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. Not a bad idea. Um, that's interesting because, of course, that would be consistent with some of the ideas coming from entanglement theory that you know, it's some property of you which is actually pulling the patient into a state of good health. So thank you for those questions. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, Graham, I understand you've got another question. Yes, another question, please, Mike. I think earlier on you used the analogy of the kind of push-pull mechanism. So the, the, the push mechanism was like the, the GP, we get somebody who comes to surgery, identifies a specific problem, um, treats that, that problem or that symptom. And then you talked about the kind of pull approach and link that into, again, this kind of balance or imbalance in the systems. And it, 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 it appears to me that's quite an, quite an exciting concept. Now, I wonder if you've got any ideas about how you might apply that work to the field of, of kind of health, health education, um, because it strikes me that, that one important uh, possible application of this work is the notion of creating balance within the system and preventing ill health rather than simply treating ill, Ill health once it's actually occurred. If you look at the traditional medicines, I mean, the Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, the, um, the, the, and indeed Hippocratic medicine, the emphasis has always been on lifestyle as a way of maintaining health. So it's always been a preventative mm. approach. 
And I think that really, when the system has gone wrong, when there's a robust error, you know, complementary medicine is not going to mend broken legs. I think that's the, the important point. Mm -hmm. And if you've got a really nasty infection, you know, you need antibiotics. You mm -hmm. know, so you know, robust errors need robust treatments. Um, and I think where we're, what we're dealing with, with in complementary medicine is, is the causal sequence before that. And that, I think, is, is a, a very important, as you say, from the mm -hmm. point of view of health education, that um, these, these different lifestyle things seem to get the, the body back into balance. Mm -hmm. And um, whether it's a, an appropriate sort of diet, and there's a lot of controversy about diet, and whether it's, it's meditation and there. I, my own experience is whenever I'm talking about meditation, it, it does seem to be healthy. You know, and some people don't like the use of the word meditation. If you don't like the use of the word meditation, call it mental relaxation. <laughs> You'll find that much, much. <laughs> Talk about mental relaxation. Whatever it is, it does seem to help if you can stop your mind racing. And the, the sort of mind racing is, is clearly not a particular, you know, if you feel you just can't stop thinking, that's not a terribly good thing. So um, th there are lots of things you can do in terms of lifestyle modifications. And part of the problem, I think, is that when we talk about healthy lifestyles, we don't fully understand it. There's some very recent um, suggestions that high levels of exercise are, in, uh, they tend to be inflammatory, pro-inflammatory, whereas low levels of exercise are anti-inflammatory. So if you go and do marathon running, it's kind of not very good for you. And that implies that, you know, the Tai Chi, the Qi Kung, the Zhang Zhong, all these sort of rather slow type yogas, they're all the same thing, you see. I mean, really, they're, they're mind-body exercises. Um, but really, that is that's actually, if you're trying to be healthy, that's what you should be going for. If you want to be fit, of course, you should go and run marathons, but uh, being fit is not necessarily healthy. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're imbalanced because mm -hmm. you can run fast. So I think that's, that sort of understanding is not terribly good. Equally, if you know there's ideas about what is a healthy diet, and what may be healthy for one person may not be healthy for another. Traditional Chinese medicine suggests that what is healthy in one season is not healthy in another season. Mm -hmm. So you have a whole complex notion which is maybe well be possible, but we haven't really established. Mm -hmm. I think perhaps, you know, that is a very important research area, quite separate from complementary medicine, is to try and pin down those long-term changes. Fortunately, you probably need um, longitudinal studies. Mm -hmm. Terribly difficult to get funding for longitudinal studies. Mm -hmm. Particularly mm -hmm. something which is a little bit sort of speculative. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Jack, you know. yeah, Mike, we touched briefly on the uh, condition of the practitioner. Yeah. Um, looking at the, at the patient or the, uh, the client, in conventional medicine, I think it, it's generally accepted that the, the way the patient perceives their illness can have an effect on their healing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you accept that that is the case, how can you actually bring that into studies on, on complementary therapies? How can you actually take into account the fact that the patient wants to get better or doesn't want to get better in something like a scientific blinded controlled trial? Yeah, yeah. Do you and, think, do you th and do you think that should be something that we, we need to be looking at? Yeah, I mean I think one of the problems with controlled, randomized controlled trials yeah. is that it assumes a particular mechanism. Yeah. Uh, the mechanism may not be the right mechanism. Mm. Um, it's not the only methodology for mm -hmm. investigating things. That's the problem. Mm. Um, because it's the best methodology for the assumptions that conventional medicine has, yes. uh, the assumption is that it must be the best methodology for all mm -hmm. other types of medicine. And that's not logically the case. Um, the randomized controlled trial is based on something called the experiment. Mm. Now, if you look on the uh, you know, in the philosophy of science, there are debates about the validity of the experiment. And the experiment has a certain logical weakness in it, yeah. which is uh, all to do with the fact that it doesn't test for unknown interactions. Yeah. And um, that's precisely what probably happens in conventional medicine trials yeah. as, as, as well as, as um, complementary medicine trials. You see, if you compare medicine with physics, uh, or medicine with chemistry, it's actually very interesting. Medicine is like psychology, we have statistics. Now the reason you have statistics is because you have qualitative predictions. You predict that one group is going to be better than another group. You don't say how many people are going to be better, you don't say how much they're going to be better. But if you think about physics, you have you know, um, a, a law which expresses how much a, 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 a spring is going to expand, mm. Hooke's law, when you mm. put a weight on mm. it, and this boils or how much a gas will expand. You don't say, you know, putting a weight will make it go down, mm. you know, let's test whether it goes yes. down or up. Quite different, you actually test mm. the precise. Now, that's because it's a quantitative test, yes. it's making quantitative predictions. 
And what we've got, I think, is that the reason we have qualitative predictions in medicine and in psychology is because we're leaving out so many variables which are important. And what I feel is, actually, we've, it, we've got to move the science of complementary medicine away from a science modelled on medicine and psychology, which is a science based on qualitative ideas, to one which is modelled on physics and chemistry. Mm -hmm. In other words, we have to have much more robust predictions based on theory. And that means we need theory development. And if we think about it from a history of science, do you mind me diverging on the yeah, history of science yeah. point of view? Um, let's take the, I mean, the, there were two major ideas in the history of science in the 20th century. One was development, quantum mechanics, the other was complexity theory. Both of those ideas, the, the theoretical ideas were developed before the empirical observation. So if we take the observation of entanglement, that was predicted. It was predicted actually by Einstein as a way of saying quantum mechanics is not going to work. Mm. Right? Yeah. That was his prediction. Mm -hmm. And so it was, he said, you know, this is a, uh, something which we can uh, test. And when it was tested, lo and behold, this counterintuitive phenomenon occurred. So it's theory preceding the data. And I think, therefore, that you know, just blindly collecting data mm. is not the solution. You actually have to think about it a little bit more. Thank you. Mm. Okay, Alistair, you had another question? Yes, yeah, so away from <coughs> research. So you mentioned your networks and your systems and you mentioned yeah. the physiological and the psychological. Yeah. Would you consider any other aspect of human being, such as the spiritual aspect? And if so, where does that fit into your entanglement? Yeah, I think if you... I mean, it's, it's very interesting, the difference between mind, body and spirit, mm. because we use the words, um, but in conventional yeah. approaches, mind and spirit are the mm. same thing. Mm. They're very clearly not the same thing in Ayurvedic medicine. My understanding of Chinese medicine is that the, the, the word Shen is actually used for both. So mm. uh, that, that's, uh, I don't know if you, you, you yeah, know. Yeah, Chinese medicine, it's the one system. Yeah. Basically, yeah. Um, but certainly yeah. in Ayurvedic medicine, you have a difference between the mind and the spirit. Mm. And indeed, if you look at um, Edward Bach's um, book, Heal Thyself, mm. um, he actually suggests that one of, the one of the causes of disease is a disparity between the mind and the spirit. Mm. You grow apart. You can have other explanations for it, but it's, it's a very interesting idea. Now, I think if you start talking about entanglement, you immediately come to this possibility mm. of entangling with something which is not yeah. just the human. Um, and uh, indeed, there has been a paper published in homeopathy, or yes, the first mm. paper has been published by Lionel Milgram mm. from the Imperial College, uh, looking at the mathematics of a, an entanglement mm. which involves a practitioner and a, a yeah. remedy. Um, and I think that once you talk about entanglement, of course the notion of spirituality mm. starts coming into mm. a possibility. And uh, just precisely what that is, one doesn't yeah. know, but certainly the, mm. the mechanism is there. Yeah. But what it, what it almost means is that, you know, the spirituality is a natural phenomenon. Mm. You know, it's not some sort of thing that should be locked away for those who have religious mm. beliefs. Yeah. And in fact, it's quite separate from re religious yeah. beliefs. It's a natural phenomenon of some form of connection with something else. And um, it, it's actually very interesting to see how this idea of a connection with something else mm. actually does run through all religions, in a some, often in a sort of hidden away fashion. I mean, yoga, the word yoga actually means, you know, the mm. coming together of, of the, the spirit and the mm. divine, your mind and the divine. If you look at Christian, Christian uh, doctrine, well, you don't get much of it, but uh, um, if you look at the mystical writings in the, in the med medieval period, um, books such as The Cloud of Unknowing, the essential idea is you, you, don't, you don't pray to God for anything. You, know, you don't pray with, please, God, give me X, Y, and Z. What you do is you simply contemplate God. And you don't think about God's works or anything else. So it's simply, co you know, this, again, unification of the divine. So, very interesting that you're getting the same sort of idea from entirely different religious mm. traditions. And when you get these similar ideas, mm. I mean, the same with meditation, you, um, you, have, you say mantras in, in the Hindu, you, you say your rosary in the Catholic, I mean, it's remarkably similar. Mm. You begin to think, well, isn't that interesting that there's this similarity? Mm. So my feeling is, yes, there is, there is a room there for some kind of um, mm. um, connection which may be with something which either embodies all people, which is you know, Teilhard de Chardin's yeah. idea, or something which is supernatural to the whole human, yeah. you know, which is in some sense. Yeah. And I don't know what that is, okay. but it's a possibility. Mm. Okay. okay. Um, we've got a, a, an emailed question. It's right. from uh, Karen Hanley from the Plymouth Medical School. Right. Yeah. Um, and the question is, do you think that the more involved GP in the past who had contact with the whole family and who knew the patient more intimately, possibly from birth to death, gave the patient a more holistic effect even though the medicine was less advanced. 
Well, hello, Karen. Um, yes, um, I think you're absolutely right there. You see, I think what happens is that entanglement is not an instantaneous phenomenon. Mm. And if we're talking about this sort of this healing effect, in the, what we've tended to do is to say, and in fact, I'm, I'm just as guilty as anyone else, say, you know, that the, the family doctor had this therapeutic relationship and it was that which was actually causing the, the therapeutic effect with, with, with the patient. But, I mean, what you're implying, and I think it's an interesting question, is that by getting to know the patient and the family, you're in some sense entangling with the patient, and therefore you're, you're able to have a healing effect because you know the patient. If we look at the experience of therapists, they will often say that you need a little while to get to connect with your mm -hmm. patient. Uh, you know, you can say that mm -hmm. um, you, know, you need six treatments. Well, the six treatments may be that and that's how long it takes to actually start the entanglement. And it may be that the, the family doctor in, gets to know the patient, and when the patient is ill, is it in some sense able to exert some influence over the network so that the, the patient feels better? Now obviously that's, that is not going to mend a broken leg, but it is going to kind of cheer the patient up a bit. It's going to help the, the, the you know, all these, these challenges to modern medicine, which are increasing. The chronic fatigue is going out of the roof. Asthma is increasing. Diabetes, all these dysregulatory diseases are increasing. So it may be that that was where the family doctor was having a, a powerful effect. Yes, a very good point. I think it also illustrates this idea that it's not something which is peculiar to CAM, it's something which anyone... Okay, Mike, um, we've got Ray, uh, Ray Jones back on the, on the telephone. Ray, may we have your question, please? Hello, uh, Mike, this is an absolutely fascinating uh, presentation and, and discussion. I was just um, wondering, uh, at the, at the sort of, as, as you're sort of coming towards the end here, um, one of the interesting things must be, you know, how, how do other how do medics, how do other people in the health services, how, they, how are they reacting to this, this new theory? Because um, you've got to try and find money to do some research to provide some evidence. And uh, I was wondering what sort of reaction you're getting uh, in, the, in, the, in the discussions that you've had with possible funding bodies. Well, let me sort of go back a bit. And uh, before I got into complementary medicine, in the, I was working on complexity theory. And that, I think, is you can do complexity theory without complementary medicine. I think complementary medicine needs complexity theory. Complexity theory doesn't need complementary medicine. And when I give talks on, com on complexity theory, I get one of two responses. One response was, well, you must be right. Isn't this interesting to think of it this way? The other response was, this is so different from what I normally understand that I simply don't understand it. So you've got in a sort of a bifurcation of views with regard to complexity theory. With regard to complementary medicine, that, that's a more complex issue. There is a Department of Health initiative at the moment where various people, including ourselves, are, are, are applying for funding. And so I think there is beginning to be some funding available. There is a problem in that there's an awful lot of poor quality complementary medicine research which has been done, which in a sense, you know, doesn't help the field. I think we have to we do have to move towards better quality. So there's a Department of Health um, funding, but otherwise you have problems. The, some of the charities have earmarked money for complementary research. For example, the National Asthma Campaign has a very small budget which is earmarked for complementary re medicine research. Uh, but clearly it is much more difficult to get this money from the, from the normal medical sources because it is looked at as peripheral. It's looked on by some as being useful um, as long as it's not threatening. So they sort of, um, uh, uh, complementary medicine as a palliative in cancers is, is, is kind of non-threatening to the oncologist, so it's often accepted in areas like this. Okay. Um, <coughs> Mike, thank you very, very much indeed for such an interesting presentation, and uh, I hope you'll come back again when you've done a little bit more on, on your theory. Um, I need to say thank you very much to my guests, uh, Graham and Jack and Alistair. Thank you very much to the viewers and to the people that ask the questions. Uh, coming up um, in, in an hour or so's time is, is a second seminar um, entitled Information Strategy for the NHS by Dr. Peter Jury. So I hope you can join us for that. Um, but all, I wish you all now um, a very good afternoon and thank you again for your time. Goodbye. <laughs>
and welcome to another in the series of the Institute of Health Studies Research Seminars. Before Christmas, we enjoyed an interesting presentation from Bob Gann on the topic of NHS Direct Online. This month, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Mike Highland. Mike is from the Department of Psychology, University of Plymouth, and will discuss with us new ways of thinking about complementary medicine. Joining Mike and I today are Jacqueline Sullivan, who is a community nurse from Mid Devon, Graham Russell, and Alistair McConnell, who are senior lecturers with the Institute of Health Studies. They will assist us in further inquiry of Mike's presentation while we await your telephone calls. The number to call is 01752 233 646, or you can email us on tvstudios at plymouth.ac. UK. Today's programme will follow its usual format. I will shortly ho hand over to Mike and following his presentation we will be keen to receive your calls. This is, will be about between 12.30 and 1 o'clock. Can I remind you at this point that you do, do need to utilise a mute button on your handset as you speak. This will avoid the feedback sometimes experienced. Do call. Your contributions are most valuable. Now, without further delay, I'll hand over to Mike to enjoy new ways of thinking about complementary medicine. Welcome, wherever you're listening. And perhaps I could say before I start that from my perspective, there's no such thing as a silly question or a silly comment. So, whatever it is, uh, email us, phone us. We'd be deli delighted to hear from you. Now, before talking about complementary medicine, I think it's useful to put it in the context of conventional medicine. And I think it's equally important to recognise how successful conventional medicine has been. If we evaluate the various parts of conventional medicine in terms of lives saved, undoubtedly immunisation is the great lifesaver. That has saved millions and millions of lives. But there have been other very important developments Antibiotics have saved lives, equally the development of steroids. We can now control inflammatory diseases which otherwise would have killed people. Modern medicine has also been very successful in the management of trauma and in surgery. However you look at it, modern medicine has been a very successful endeavour. But there are certain areas where modern medicine has been less successful. One of these areas it's what is generally known as malaise states, or sometimes called polysymptomatic malaise. And although they're not familiar to hospital doctors, they'll be familiar to every GP. These are patients who feel a little unwell. They often have mouth ulcers, or repeated headaches, or repeated episodes of colds. They have gastric complaints, diarrhea, and constipation. They're frequently depressed, and often they're very tired. And they come into the GP and they say, Doctor, I'm not feeling very well what's wrong with me, and the doctor can say nothing. Because there is no disease for these patients, there's no treatment. At the extreme end of these malaise states, there are diseases which have got labels, such as, such as irritable bowel syndrome. Now, in irritable bowel syndrome, you have a particular abnormal function of the bowel, but there's no pathophysiology. There's nothing which you can actually see wrong in the bowel itself. We don't really know what causes it. And if we take that very puzzling disease, chronic fatigue syndrome, or ME stroke CFS, as it's called these days, well, there are abnormalities. You have a specific function, a specific error. If we correct that specific error, then modern medicine is generally successful. When we turn to complementary and alternative medicines, and there's a whole range of them, they're also sometimes referred to as traditional medicines because some of them uh, go back many years. Modern medicine actually derives from one of those traditional medicines, Hippocratic medicine. Here we have a very different idea that the body is a system in balance. The Hippocratic medicine, it was the balance of the four humours. Black bile, yellow bile, phlegm, I always like the phlegm, and blood. If you look at Chinese medicine, well, there are a whole lot of other yins and yangs and other things. And in the Ayurvedic medicine, you have the doshas. And the essential idea is that disease is caused by an imbalance in the these uh, these humours, or whatever it is, which permeates the whole body. And treatment consists of correcting this imbalance, an entirely different view. There isn't a localised cause of disease, it's a distributed cause of disease. 
Now, why did Modison, why, why did Modison medicine reject the assumptions of distributed disease? Because that's precisely what it did. When Modison medicine grew out of Hippocratic medicine, what it actually did was develop a new idea based on localised disease. And the reason was very simple, that there's no, or there was no, at the time, clear scientific evidence for anything other than mechanism. We think that it was not only clocks and steam engines, the whole idea of the universe was based on the idea of mechanism. God was a kind of mechanical uh, puppeteer, and we were the puppets who were mechanically manipulated. And so this idea that the uh, body was a machine wasn't just an uh, idiosyncratic idea which was found in medicine, it was an idea which was found throughout the whole of the science in the 18th and 19th centuries, and also in the 20th century. But there has always been a problem in applying the mechanical analogy to humans, or indeed to organisms. And it's a problem which has been recognised for many years. In fact, there was a large discussion low cortisol levels, you have slightly raised cytokines, but nothing so abnormal that you can really explain the tremendous disability with these patients. So here again, we have a puzzle which is not explained, no real clear treatment for either of these diseases in terms of medicines. And finally, chronic diseases. Well, medicine... Uh, modern medicine has been very good in controlling many chronic diseases. Let's take asthma. Asthma is caused by inflammation in the lungs, in the airways. And uh, we have some very effective drugs, in fact steroids, which will reduce that inflammation. It keeps people alive, it keeps them perfectly healthy. But it doesn't cure the asthma. It's rather like having a fire which you're constantly having to pour water over. We never actually put the fire out. So whereas modern medicine is good at managing many chronic diseases, in other cases, particularly these autoimmune or inflammatory diseases, asthma, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, um, multiple sclerosis, prostatitis, all these various things, they are particularly difficult for modern medicine to actually cure. Now, modern medicine is based on a set of ideas or assumptions. It's based and it derives from an analogy, an analogy with mechanism. You can often say that modern medicine derives its intellectual roots from the development of clocks in the Middle Ages. Clocks which led to steam engines and eventually to computers. And the central idea is that one can treat the body as a machine. Harvey's discovery of the circulation of the blood was a prime example of a discovery which showed that the body is just a pumping system. And of course, if we have a machine, machines have specific faults. When your car breaks down, there's always a particular fault that is actually responsible for it, whether it's in the ignition, whether it's in the petrol system, whatever, there's always a specific fault. So the idea of a specific fault is an assumption which modern medicine has. And if we look at that a particular assumption, we find that the diseases that modern medicine is most successful at treating are those diseases where there's a question about it in the 1920s and 30s. And the problem is that there all seems to be some very important difference between living creatures and mechanical systems. Let's take the example of a jumbo jet. A jumbo jet is in many ways like a body. It has specific parts. Just like you have your toes and your hands, the jumbo jet has its wings and its engines. But the jumbo jet also has systems. It has in its electrical system, it has a hydraulic system, just like you have systems. You have an immune system and you have an endocrine system. So there's a lot of similarity between the jumbo jet and a human, but there's one important difference, and that is that big jumbo jets don't grow from little jumbo jets. And if a big jumbo jet goes wrong, then the big jumbo jet doesn't heal itself. It has to be taken into a hangar and a completely different system. These intelligent humans have to swarm over it, getting it right. So that is a, a real problem with the mechanical analogy. And there have been two approaches, two ways of solving this, none of which, until recently, have been very satisfactory. One was the idea of vitalism. Now, you know the, the story of Frankenstein. Frankenstein gets a, a dead body, and he, or parts of a dead body, sews them together, and, but of course it isn't alive. It hasn't got something which makes it alive. And uh, Mary Shelley it, used this idea of vitalism, and very simply, she got a mysterious force. Now, in the 19th century, the mysterious force was, was electricity. There are lots of other mysterious forces, such as uh, nuclear energy, which you'd have today, but then it was electricity. The dead body is connected up to this mysterious force and zaps it, and lo and behold, we get a living body. 
That was the idea of vitalism. But there was also another suggestion, which was never proved in the early 20s and 30s, which was that the bodies of living organisms are organised in some fundamentally different way. And it's the process of, it's the phenomenon of organisation which differentiates living creatures from mechanical systems. 